to ancient Maya and Aztec peoples of Central America had a deep understanding of time, feeling that it greatly impacted human affairs. They were not so different than ancient Sumerian, Indian, or Chinese civilizations in observational skills. Mesoamericans did not perceive time being linear as we do. Rather, they saw it as a series of repeating cycles. They believed each cycle had a specific purpose, repeating spans providing a connection between past, present, and future. The Maya and Aztec peoples had a deep understanding of the cosmos and movements of the sun, moon, the planets, and stars. Using this knowledge, they created a calendar accurate to within a few minutes and is considered one of the most accurate in human history. Considering the absence of what we call modern technology, feats of astronomical observation and mathematical prediction for the positions of the stars and planets is nothing less than astonishing. They were far ahead of European efforts when the Spanish invaded the Americas. Developments preceding those of the Maya were undoubtedly pioneered by the Olmec and Toltec civilizations, but continued to be refined. Time scales built on their base 20 system, including zero, were divided into solar and lunar cycles. They made up the log count, which stretched over tens of thousands of years, plotting and predicting the shorter term summer and winter solstices or the spring equinox only made sense for knowing the best times to plant or where to hunt particular game. In this sense, activity in the heavens was truly linked to man's survival on earth. It makes sense that early calendars would need to be portable and developed before cities ever existed. Such an effort would require record keeping by shamans or other early astronomers and would need to be mobile. I imagine a system rather like the knotted strings used by the Inca, but predated them by 5,000 years or more. This likely preceded fixed agricultural settlements by signaling times for harvesting wild crop varieties before animals or pests consume them. It would be useful for planning movements between these resources. Even then, there could be floods or droughts making that future uncertain. There may well have been a time when more cosmic events could be predicted. Mesoamericans could predict eclipses and probably meteor showers as well. Lunar cycles were likely a shortcut for marking the passage of the year, indicating when small groups of humans should move or gather resources. In time, correlations were made between solar and lunar calendars. At the next level, the observation of Five visible planets were convenient, at least for Mercury, Venus, and Mars, within a lifetime, but Saturn and Jupiter were useful for multi-generational time spans. If solar and lunar cycles repeated along with the movements of some planets over a few generations, then eras running in circles along with them is not so far-fetched. Objects in the heavens were observed to move in arcs across the sky, and nature is full of circles, from the circumference of a tree to the shape of a water droplet or that of the moon. The ancient Greeks believed the circle was a perfect and even divine shape. We were stuck with no other possibility than Pythagorean perfection for 2,000 years. Planetary orbits could not possibly be imperfect ellipses. In junior and senior level physics classes, more than once, an instructor would tell us, remember when we told you X, Y, or Z? Well, we lied. There's a lot more to it than that. At least these guys were being honest. To be fair, they were giving us the various concepts in more digestible chunks, which I greatly appreciated. Still, it would have been nice to know at the time that there was more to the story for enticement. But what if active professors and researchers don't know the answers themselves? Should they give us what sound like authoritative pronouncement, knowing we're not likely to question them, or a hint there's more for us to delve into on our own? Granted, most undergraduates, myself included, would not have had the time or talent for advanced independent study 
considering the constraints. I did appreciate professors who dropped real life anecdotes for subjects within their specialization. Ancient astronomers were familiar with Earth's polar cycle long ago. It determines what constellations are visible in a certain direction at a particular time of the year. The basis for the Osiris correlation is founded on that movement. The Osiris correlation is used as partial proof that the Giza pyramids were built closer to 12,800 years ago rather than 5,500 years ago. The Sphinx is said to have been originally a lion facing toward the constellation Leo at the time it was carved. The positions of the three pyramids are in relative positions to those of the stars in Orion's belt. The cycle had to be deduced after generations of observation and recording over thousands of years, as the entire cycle takes nearly 26,000 years to complete. I offer this conjecture based on inductive reasoning. It seems logical that quite a bit of data would be necessary to piece it all together. Where I'm at a loss is the modern explanation of the phenomenon called precession. If we spin a top fast enough, it will stay vertical for some time. I've even been successful in spinning golf tees. Most tops experience a fair amount of friction between the tip of the and the surface upon which it spins. This slows the top down. As the angular velocity is reduced, the top tries to maintain constant angular momentum. The axis of rotation slowly moves toward the table to increase distance from a vertical and thereby make up for the loss. This is how the Earth's precession or wobble is generally explained. Planets, however, are not spinning tops on a table. There's no friction in space, so the movement of the axis with respect to the fixed stars should be constant. The only explanation I have found is that tidal effects from the moon and sun are the cause of the Earth's precession. The title of this podcast is Circles Within Circles, but it just as well could be Spirals Within Spirals. This is what Birkeland currents are. Almost fractal in nature, these consist of plasma streams moving in spirals. The discoverer of these currents, Christian and Birkelin, deduced their form while studying the northern lights. Picturing the lines of magnetic force, we have a toroidal shape with a center diameter of zero. In a magnet, these lines of force extend from the south pole to the north pole in ever wider arcs. If a moving charged particle, electron or ion, encounters this field line, it will be accelerated perpendicularly toward that line of force. The particle then moves in a circular fashion about that line of force with a velocity component parallel to that line in opposite directions. As the diameter of each helical path also depends on the masses of the particles, they will separate into multitude of coaxial channels. It has a lot to chew on, so I'll explain it another way. If you are a negatively charged particle and the magnetic field line is pointing away from you, you will move forward, but also counterclockwise about that field line. To your left and right are streams of positively charged particles moving toward you with concentric paths inside and outside of yours. This brings us to an alternative explanation for what that procession of the constellations discovered by our oh-so-clever ancestors was about. The helices of the type explained previously in reference to the auroras are not isolated to the northern or southern lights. Remember that a star is also a great ball of plasma which moves through space. Glowing helical tracks have been observed throughout the universe with brighter areas containing galaxies along the path. Some of these are many thousands of light years in length, at least where they are glowing. These galaxies are aligned with the direction of the helix and spaced along its length. Our own solar system moves in a cyclical fashion toward one side of the galactic plane or the other. If we are moving along a similar helical path, then the standard explanation of Earth's precession need not apply. Imagine our solar system moving with the axis of the ecliptic plane, 
pointed along a helical path, the Earth's axis of rotation relative to the solar system need not change, as our solar system moves along the helix, then the direction of the Earth's axis will slowly move relative to distant stars according to our position along the spiral. A helix matching the angle of the Earth's wobble would account for what constellations we see and where we see them throughout each helical cycle. A helical cycle of approximately 26,000 years would then account for our seeing a different set of constellations as we move about its circumference. For stars on a line close to the center of the helix, these would remain fixed toward the center of the zodiac. Stars traveling along with us would appear fixed as would those far distant from the path we are on. Now imagine we're making a rope or a cable. First we wind two wires or fiber strands about each other. Then we take several of those windings and twist those about each other and so on. This is how Birkeland currents arrange themselves. Just as the ancients compounded shorter cycles into longer ones, in an electric universe, this is the order of things. We have circles within circles or spirals within spirals. As in a cable, though locally wires are arranged in twisted portions or helices, those helices may gently wind around yet a larger structure. This means that the center path about which our solar system moves in turn does not remain straight, but winds again along an even larger spiral. I don't know if this is what the Mayans or others had in mind, but it is interesting that so many cultures around the world are fascinated by serpents or dragons. I've always wondered why nearly every culture worldwide, from the Celts to the Chinese, have so many dragon motifs and stories. Similarly, the sight of comets in the sky is taken for a signal or bad omen, also by the ancient societies around the globe. Mentioned earlier were cosmic cycles unrelated to those of the seasons. Meteors, though short-lived, resemble comets or serpents. They have a head and a long tail of fire. Perhaps this is where the myth of the fire-breathing dragon comes from. The Earth undergoes several meteor showers in its orbit. These also were observed and recorded. Evidence of a meteor strike was discovered on a mountaintop in Europe. It was tracked based upon highly accurate Sumerian observations in cuneiform found on a clay tablet. Ancient civilizations must have known, as we do, of periodic meteor showers. Surely there were times in our distant past when not every meteor shower was so benign. We could have been hit with much larger debris from deep space. In our available records, such showers consist of very small particles, which do little damage. The recent meteor in Russia and the remote Tunguska event in Siberia have been notable exceptions. Graham Hancock and others believe they found evidence of a cataclysmic strike or strikes at the end of the last ice age. Though no written records are available for this period, there is nothing ruling it out. Glass nodules and ash layers, along with exotic elements like indium, date from this time period. So does the mass extinction of megafauna throughout the northern hemisphere. We don't really know how far back this understanding of astronomy goes, but new finds continue to push back the dates of our so-called civilization. The ancients may have been far wiser than today's scientists will admit. If such cataclysms did occur, we know there were people to witness them. Homo sapiens have been around at least 300,000 years. That's a long time for the collection of such accounts through oral or written history. Even today, sites like Gobekli Tepe and older had occupants who were contemporaries with mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. Seeing what happened to their brothers along with the vast extinction of animal life would make a lasting impression. Vast fires covering Europe along with North and South America would coincide with such strikes with their accompanying smoke and ash darkening large portions of the planet. The eruption of Krakatoa in the late 19th century had the effect of cooling the planet to notable reduction in crop yields.
Events 12,800 years ago may have been preceded with dread and wonder for many months. Comets are often visible over a long period. Perhaps then there was no memory of a prior disaster, and it was only noted that the tail of the serpent was growing as the nights passed. Only when the object became ever larger in the sky would panic set in. Then perhaps, like Shoemaker Levy 9, which hit Jupiter, it broke up into several pieces, striking in rapid succession. Today we have many telescopes scanning the sky for such dangers, but these objects are notoriously difficult to see. We believe we are far more sophisticated than our forefathers. But with our technology, we still do not possess the means to avert tragedy of this scale. The recent DART mission by NASA was only a start. Striking the satellite of an asteroid did move it slightly, but the object is not nearly large enough to be a planet killer. These objects naturally increase in velocity as they fall toward the sun. It is not likely we could catch one of them in time, even if we knew where it was. With gravity assist, it takes our spindly craft a long time to even get to the asteroid belt. Waiting for our nemesis to close the distance only increases the amount of energy needed to divert it, so timing is critical. Likely, it would require a fleet of spacecraft at the ready, like Minuteman missiles then the rockets would have to be powerful enough to close on the target to either destroy it or nudge it out of the way. Altering the trajectory is, of course, much easier at considerable distances than it is up close. In the end, Elon Musk has the right idea, if he wishes to preserve humanity at an advanced technological level. Musk, like our forefathers, has brilliant insight, but can it be utilized in time?